Uh, what's up, everyone? Welcome to Questions You Never Thought to Ask, the podcast where I speak to kayakers about kayaking and stuff. Uh, I'm Seth Ashworth, and this week I'm joined with Ben Stukesbury, man, myth, legend, over 70 first ascents in 15 countries, uh, and someone who has been at the top of the expedition kayaking world for, I want to say forever, but at least as long as I've been interested in kayaking. Uh, ben, how you doing? Yeah, real good, Seth. Thanks for uh, having me on. Cool. So I'm going to get right into it. Uh, you were recently kidnapped in Colombia. Uh, you've had a number of other notable run-ins um, with the law all over the world. What's your best arrest story? <laughs> oh, the best arrest story? Man, you know, I guess now that I think about it, I guess it'd probably be, what was it, 2007 in Chiapas. It was, um, I guess it would have been my second or third trip back to the Santa Domingo after we, after we first did the Santa Domingo in uh, 2005, I believe it was, with Jesse Coombs. I went back with Josh Bechtel, who was working with the Twitch series, um, John Burrell, let's see, Brad Sutton was with us, Canadian paddler, and uh, we were running the Santa Domingo again, but then we were also interested in running sort of the main tributary to the Santa Domingo. So Santa Domingo, is, as many of you probably know, is the, the famous section of whitewater that's down in Chiapas, sort of on the other side of Chiapas from the Agua Azul. And it's got like the steepest quarter, steepest runnable quarter mile in kayaking, according to me. And um, right at the bottom of that quarter mile, it kind of divides the river into two stretches. There's the waterfalls up above it, and then below it, it gets a big tributary coming out of Guatemala called the Pohom. And so we were like, oh, well, I guess it's time to try the Pohom. So we drove out towards the Guatemala border, which you know, this whole region, not so much today, but, you know, even still today, there was, especially back um, when they were doing a lot of rafting trips, the, all those rivers down in that area, the Agua Azul included, are flowing into the, a big river called the Umacinta, which is the largest river in Central America. And that Umacinta was notorious for drug running, um, running arms. There was a pretty famous incident back in the 90s, I believe, when a raft group ran into some smugglers and some of the rafters were actually shot. So it's, it's always been sort of a, a weird area that, you know, that sort of permeable border down there with Guatemala. So we knew that there was the potential to have some interesting run-ins, but we had had such good experiences on the Santa Domingo and with those people, and I'd already been there a few times, so maybe let let my guard down in that respect. Um, at any rate, we started boating down the Pahome. We put in off of a, sort of a lonely little dirt road and um, boated downstream a few hours. All of a sudden, got to a place where the river was going into a canyon, and it went directly underground and it wasn't like the river went under rocks or sieves it, it literally there was a mountain in front of us and this whole major river that we knew eventually f flowed into the San Domingo literally went under the side of this mountain and so um, you know short of some crazy jungle trek over this mountain that we really hadn't anticipated at all we just turned around and and started hiking back towards the put-in, which uh, took us through the sketchy little village that we had floated through on the way down. And I had kind of gotten a bad feeling from the village. You know, people weren't, you know, weren't super friendly. They were kind of staring at us. And so I, I kind of all of a sudden started to become, started to get a little bit concerned about that. And sure enough, um, when we got near the village, uh, people started yelling. In fact, we're, we're down by the river trying to move through the area as quickly as possible. And all of a sudden, on a, a loudspeaker, like the, the village had an intercom system. They're <laughs> you know, yelling at us in Spanish, you know, para, para, you know, 
o el, el grupo cerca del río para ahí and uh, telling us to stop and pretty quickly we're surrounded by a group of oh, I don't know at least a dozen pretty agitated uh, just locals you know no real officials that I could tell uh, all carrying machetes and um, they want to bring us back to the village they say that the you know that they've been directed to bring us back to the village and we need to We need to we need to join them, and at that point, it's like we're doing everything we can. I'm trying to figure out what you know what the hell we can do to to not go with them back to the village and have the situation sort of I don't know escalate if not if not lengthen. And um, we've got uh, we we all have like watersheds around our necks and. and uh, I personally, I have every every dollar that I own at that time is in my watershed. I think I have like 600 bucks in my watershed to finish out the trip, my camera, maybe all the footage from the trip. I mean, I'm just thinking, man, this this is not a good deal. We're, we're carrying these huge kayaks. You know, we've got our watershed bags. You know, not only can we not fight these guys, um, but we certainly can't run. And... Um, <laughs> and I hate to throw Brad under the bus here, but all of a sudden he's like, oh, man, you know, gosh, I, I think we could take him. Obviously, these guys aren't even speaking very <laughs> good Spanish. They're like, you know, they're speaking some kind of local Mayan dialect. And it's just like, holy fuck, Brad, no. You know, like, we, <laughs> we are outnumbered here, and they have huge machetes. And so somehow – we were able to negotiate down and I, I gave him something like 200 or $300 and we walked out of there. And I don't think I've ever walked as fast in my life with a kayak as I did right then. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, we didn't necessarily get detained. Um, but yeah, I guess it was that 20, 20 minutes, half hour where it really could have gone on either way. We, you know, Brad could have, gone nuts and tried to start Chuck Norris seeing all these like 15 uh, probably Zapatistas down there on the border or uh, these guys could have just taken us at machete point up into the village and then at that point who knows what would have happened um, and you know that was considering that on my very first paddling trip to Chiapas in 2002 um, a group of Zapatistas tried to take us to shore, detain us on the Hatate River. And that was just a, maybe a month after a French-Canadian paddling group on the same river was detained, held for a week, and then relieved of all of their... They had rafts, they had everything. They, so they left with nothing there. So it was, it was one of those situations down there that... Um, didn't really result in anything too bad but it was it was sort of a funny situation and and pretty easy to get out of so i mean i think brad like his points definitely had some merit like i mean you i'm sure you're a bunch of in shape guys like mm, yeah <laughs> kind of, well sure yeah i mean we're in shape but i mean these guys work with machetes every day of their lives. Yeah, I, I guess you, you at might, some point, we, like, you're very similar might to, have like, a couple Kanks inches ago. on them here and there. But, I mean, these guys were no joke. Like, they, yeah. weren't, they weren't a bunch of drunkards. They meant business. They were not excited about, you know, gringos rolling unannounced into their community. You know, and looking back on it, it they, had, they probably had a really good point. It was like, all of a sudden these uh, uniformed-looking gringos roll into their community carrying kayaks like we could have been just like, a, you know, some cadre of the CIA yeah. down there on the border with Guatemala looking for nefarious activities. Yeah, like, they might have, like, seen Point Break and thought they were, you were trying to make a kayak version of Point Break or something. Yeah, I mean, imagine if, uh, yeah, exactly. Imagine if, like, a, a troop of, you know, of uh mexican fellows rolls into some you know s some weird conservative community down there on the border with arizona like it's <laughs> it's gonna be this the same deal and it's probably not going to end nearly as, as easily as that 
No um, doubt. Yeah, you get but, guys that have way more, way more guns in Arizona. It'd be way scarier. Yeah. But certainly the most, the most fucked up um, detainment was, uh, was the 10 days that we spent under house arrest in the Congo after, uh, after we lost Henry on, on the Lakuga River uh, right outside. We were, we were kept under house arrest under Kalemi after we basically evacuated from, from 100 miles or so. Um, down yeah, did you guys have to go to court or something? Or that that whole situation sounded super fucked. Like I, I read it that. I yeah, it was fucked. And you know, it's not. It's what the hell? It's fun. It's fun to tell the stories about you know about Chiapas and you know because at the end of the day, like I've been back to Chiapas in recent years, even and and it seems like I always end up sitting down with the Zapatistas and and they have such a good point. You know, they like they had their land stolen and everything going on. It ends up being just like a, it's an educational experience in that way. But um, you know, just just the tragedy that was involved with the with the Africa experience, losing Hendry and then being in a position where um, you know potentially the government in that area was was basically trying to hoist voice the blame on, on Chris and I and put us in a situation where we could have been basically prosecuted, um, you know, for, for that loss. Um, but yeah, yeah we were definitely less fun to we, tell those stories that don't have a happy ending, isn't it? Like it's, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you all, you always want to be, um, you know, you never want to forget those stories. You never want to try not to say, you know, I, I, I like to talk about Henry is as, as much as I can, just because I think he was just such an outstanding individual and 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 a person that that um, that should be should be someone that's looked up to by by young paddlers. You know, someone that was just just as interested in the in the stories that Rivers can tell as he was in you know getting rad on the river or you know, descending a class five rapid, he was just as intrigued with like going into the villages. And I think that that's such an important aspect of our sport is just being able to, you know, just appreciate the difference between paddling down a river here in the States or in BC and having the privilege to paddle down a river that was in Colombia that was controlled 10 years ago by the FARC or something like that. And being able to really appreciate those stories and, and appreciate the, the just one of a kind place that these rivers take you. So do you uh, think this is kind of, this wasn't on my scheduled questions here, but since we're talking about it, do you think like uh, increased amounts of social media is disconnecting us from those stories and we're getting too lost in just like getting rad and getting high fee and doing something in epic mm-hmm. slow motion? Do, do you, or do you think it's helping us connect more with those stories because we see a, a, like a wider breadth of material from an area? Yeah. I mean, I think both, right? Yeah, I do think that... that um, it's real difficult to tell those stories in 60 second videos or, you know, however many characters you're allowed on Instagram, you know, however many characters people can even bear to read on Instagram, like that short format makes it certainly more challenging to, to provide those additional layers that I think are inevitably on every river. You know, when I say, Oh, if you're in BC or if you're in the U S like there's not that depth of story, that's, that's also not, you know, that's not really the case. You know, at, every river has a story for sure. Um, the Ottawa River, like, well, you know, when was the last time we really thought about, like, when those dams on the Ottawa came in and, you know, what that whole irrigation scheme is all about. and like just Yeah, the, the history the of, like, history. logging here and stuff is so wild. It's, um, it's a pretty next level, actually. There's a lot, I think a lot of people come here and they don't necessarily realize, like, how like critical this river is to the growth of Eastern Canada. Yeah. 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 And that's, I mean, the, of course it's an amazing river and like, you know, show, show some footage of some of those amazing gladiator ruins or those fucking crazy ass waves. And you're like enough said, but no, no, like, like the history of that, like, just like you're alluding to right now to me, like just that, 
those little nuggets of history and to understand that, you know, we're kayakers are riding on this like water that's just being shuttled from hydroelectric station to, you know, wherever to, to run the mills or, uh, I mean, there's just, there's just a lot of stories going on. So I think that as a, just a, as long winded a, as possible of an answer to your question, I think, I think both, I think we're, we're able to see and, and everyone is able to have a voice which is pretty badass, you know, yeah. like you don't have to be in a Twitch movie or you don't, you don't have to be, um, you know, in a Young Guns production or. <laughs> yeah, it's, having, it's pretty, forbid, it's a pretty... no big names movie. You, anybody oh, can have their the voice, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so pretty, it's it's pretty great that everybody has the opportunity for sure. All right, let's change it up again. Um, I've been doing a lot of research, like air quotes, research for this podcast. Um, sure. so I've been watching a lot of old ben films and new Ben Sixby kayak films. Uh, and I, yesterday I watched Into Twin Galaxies, um, nice. which is so great. Like, what a well done piece of like documentary movie making that doesn't have that much kayaking in it. Um, yeah. But at times it looked quite miserable, and so I wanted to. Ask <laughs> What was your worst kite ski moment? Um, actually, I think I just saw a photo from Sarah McNair Landry. If you, you don't follow her on Instagram, she's worth a follow. She's, you know, she was really the one leading Boomer and I through that. Yeah, a lot of times it was an ordeal, but it was like, it was like day twelve or so maybe day yeah. 11, day 12, before we actually got the kites up in the air. You know, we would put the kites up, like, on day 7 or day 8 when the whole debacle happened where Sarah broke her back. And we pretty yeah. much put them up because that was that was the last day that the, the, that the film guys, that Jochen Schmoll, who was the cinematographer, he came along with us for the first week because we only made it, like, 50K in the first week, so it was pretty easy for a chopper to come. Yeah, there was actually they, a pretty great little infographic on the on the movie where it's like day seven, four kilometers, and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was fucked, and yeah. she broke her back. Anyways, like, I mean, that whole story. But getting back to my toughest moment, aside from, <laughs> you know, just was like day twelve. Like we finally put up the kites for the first time. I'm just flailing my ass off. Like literally, I I had like a week long crash course up in Canada with Sarah and Boomer um, a few months prior to that. Other than that, I'd never really done it before. I'm flailing, and all of a sudden, like, I just tap into the wind. You know, I set an edge, and I'm off. I'm going, like, you know, 40, 50 clicks, kilometers an hour, just hauling ass. And I just, like, I've got, like, the dirty dancing soundtrack going in my head you know i'm just like <laughs> i'm on cloud nine it's it's literally the best day of my life and maybe about i don't know an hour in sarah comes hauling ass and this is sarah who's broken her back like five days prior so this yep. can kind of tell you just what kind of crazy rugged badass that she is she comes hauling ass up behind me and it's just like Ben, what what are you doing? Like you're going the wrong way. Like I was just going, <laughs> I I don't know what the hell I was thinking. Like I had no sense of direction. I didn't know where the fuck I was going, but I just knew for the first time that I was like going with the wind. And so, so yeah, for the remainder, the the next eight hours of that day, like I was just stressing this like tack muscle, just hitting this hard edge on a pair of skis and just fighting the wind using every muscle incorrectly in my legs using every muscle like pulling way too hard on the bar like just fucking myself up and but we did we doubled our doubled our distance that day we, we covered uh i think we covered like 50 kilometers on day 12 and it had taken us 11 days to do that uh do the first 50k so it was it was kind of a low point but it was it was the start of of things starting to move starting to get a bit more fluid and, and certainly that three weeks that we spent um on the kite skis was uh w was probably the most pleasurable of that trip 
Um, yeah, it looked pretty yeah. cold. To be to be honest with you, it looked pretty <laughs> pretty frigid the whole time. I was like, I don't know if I'd sign up for that one. But um, well, you know, and I think that that's why it's a good movie. You know, I, I give a lot of credit to Johan Schmoll, fantastic cinematographer, just a great guy in general. Um, oh yeah, but. But what he was filming was something that was very real. And there was nothing that was faked there. There's no, you know, we didn't have to make up any lines. Um, whereas in, in other kayak films that I've been a part of, like you go back at the end and you, you know, you, <laughs> you read a few lines to bring the narrative together and that sort of shit. But in, and in that, on that trip, there was no need for that. It was, um, and of course it was because he did such a good job of, of the interviews and all that shit, of course, but at the same time, I mean, it was a real story. It was a real, real fucking struggle out there. So yeah, oh, not yeah, necessarily there's, there's the kind amazing, of... <laughs> there's some amazing moments where it's like a tight, like kind of drone shot and then it just like kind of comes out and back and out and back and you're like, oh, well, these guys are pretty far away from when they're going it keeps going out and back and out and back and out and back and you're like, yeah. oh my God, they're just like three little dots in the middle of frigid, like Santa Claus land. Yeah. Ooh. All right. I'm going to move it on again. Um, we were talking a bit earlier about, uh, you know, it's hard to fund kayaking trips. And you were saying you just had, like, everything you had in your watershed bag. Um, have you ever considered, like, running drugs to, to fund uh, to fund kayak expeditions? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I, I think I've always been a, a bit of a wuss to really, truly get to that point of, uh, of running drugs. I... So I had a, I got a DUI driving while completely fucked up when I was 19 years old. I believe I was 19, yeah. And um, it was a wake-up call because I ended up spending 10 days in jail. And I was in county jail in Weld County, Colorado. It was like, you know, in, in that part of Colorado, it's really rural, a lot of farms. It was like 70%. Um, Hispanic, tons of gangs in there. Like it was just a, it was a crazy situation. And I was in a cell with a Hispanic guy that was, he hadn't been convicted of anything, but he didn't have enough money to pay bail. And so he was just going to sit there for like however long it took for him to actually go to trial and he would just cry every day. Oh, wow. And it was just a real hard, you know, it was just right in your face. It's just like, well, first of all, you know, here's here's a firsthand experience that the legal system is not at all fair. You know, it's, it's definitely if you have money to pay bail, first of all, you're going <laughs> to not spend however long it takes to go to trial. And, and it's just it's it's hard and it's sad for those people. And then. Fuck, I think I got to go outside like one once or twice in that ten days. And you know, nobody fucked with me in jail. There was no drop the soap scenarios, but shit, that shit happens too. And I was just like, Man, there's just no I just I thought to myself that I thought that there's just no amount of money that I could make from running drugs that would be worth spending time in jail so from that moment Rich. forward i was just like man you know and I, I really don't have anything against drugs my my father um would always say you know shit let's just but he was he was a bit more of a, he, he was definitely a conservative he'd always vote conservative but he was also a libertarian and he was just like let's legalize everything and just tax the shit out of it like you know yeah. leave it up to people and and so, like, that's, that's where my head's at politically. But in terms of doing it myself, I'm like, you know, the, the <sighs> things that I want to do, like, I'll, I, I would take a risk for a river. I'll take, you know, I'll, I'll, push, I'll push the envelope for access. So um, no it, to smuggling drugs. Yeah, yeah. And maybe right, it's just because I'm... Maybe it's I, just I don't think I would do it either. I'm either, not quite so. as uh, risky as, I, as people like to believe I am. All right, so what's the most risque thing you've had to do to fund your kayaking habit? Like when I did this interview with EJ, he like talked about when he was like an <laughs> and he'd go door to literally go door to door with yeah. hope to say like, hey, I'm EJ, you're a local Olympian, like it'd be great if you can have like training and whatever. Um, and 
like he's a super impressive dude to talk to about like you know doing what it takes to fund the dream. But what have, what have you had to do um, to, to make it? Work? Um, let's see. <laughs> What's one? Just one thing. I, it might be, I might be I might be embellishing a little bit, but I I I don't think so. I, I you can double check with with my buddy Dev. He I I worked for uh, his family's construction company for the first decade of my professional kayaking career and so i'd spend like four to six months doing doing construction work and one fall was uh was a bit of it was like a a bit of underwater um scuba work and not and it was maybe just a few days of the underwater work but we were actually building a bridge over iron gate reservoir up in northern california and iron gate is is famous for a uh, flesh eating bacteria. Okay. <laughs> That's uh, it's like a diatom, I believe, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the big reasons why we need, and we're actually scheduled to take, take those big dams out of the Klamath river because it's like, there's so much agriculture up in Klamath falls and then it all comes down into these three reservoirs and then it just sits there in the baking hot, California summer sun and then this flesh eating bacteria comes and yeah so for for a summer I worked alongside and then eventually in the uh the flesh eating bacteria soup of Iron Gate Reservoir and um if I'm remembering correctly that resulted in my first my first trip to Pakistan my only trip to Pakistan to the Indus River, so it was it was worth it for sure. But um, but I was wondering if, uh, especially when I when I got pretty sick in Pakistan, I think we all got pretty sick in Pakistan. Uh, but I was wondering if the flesh eating bacteria from Iron Gate Reservoir had come back to haunt me. But I guess I guess that'd probably be about the riskiest thing I've done. All right, right on. That's uh, it's always pretty entertaining whenever I ask people about that. They're always like. You know, they'll go into what the story was and the outcome is almost always like, yeah, but it was totally worth it because I got to do X, Y, Z. And I'm like, I'm pretty on board with that. Um, I was talking to Benny about your locked in trip in Papua New Guinea. And he was mentioning that he didn't poop for a week. Not because he <laughs> didn't want to poop. He just physically couldn't poop for a week. Um, yeah. Did you have a similar experience there? Like what's your, you know, do you try and keep a pretty regular poop schedule? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I... um. I'm just recently um, on a pretty heavy vegan diet. Okay. I'm also more recently um, less devout than I was maybe for the first four months when I went out with uh, when I went out with Todd. I, I joined up with Todd Wells and and did did a few kayaking trips down from Alaska down the BC coast, and you know we'd happen into locals places where they cook us a meal and at that point I just figured like there's there's no way I'm gonna say no to you know the hospitality of, of these folks out in the middle of nowhere and and so that's been a good change for me but prior to that I had uh, absolutely no qualms with just eating spaghetti and, and tuna for I mean that trip in Papua New Guinea was like 14 days so I feel like I'm partly to blame for that for maybe the lack of, uh, of fiber in our diets but um, but I always tried to just really focus on making sure that I ate enough raisins, and so that always seemed to do it for me. Even when I was eating um, spaghetti and tuna for 18 days, like I did on the uh, the trip up the George River to the to the Torngat mission. So I've fortunately never had to uh, you know deal with any sort of impacted scenarios. But it's it seems like in at that point. It was pretty close to one of us actually having to to go in for a look for for poor Benny and you know use a spoon to <laughs> help him out. But luckily, that didn't. Uh, I think he was, it would he have been a fun to... facet for the story, but uh, I'm glad it, I'm glad no one had to do that. You know, I wouldn't wish that anyone. Um, I'm I glad you just... brought up being vegan because that's actually one of my next questions. So. <laughs> it's a very nice natural segue. Um, so my question was going to be as. You know, you've been eating vegan a lot pretty recently. Is that just because yeah. it's trendy right now? Are you able to maintain that when you're on trips? Like, is it more practical? Uh -huh. Do you like so it I, more? Like, what's the what's the the impetus that put you there? Other sure. than just it's super trendy right now, and mm. you know, how do you how do you maintain it on trips and stuff? 
the impetus was I was at uh, an Earth Day film festival. I was judging an Earth Day film festival in Dallas, Texas, of all places. And I'm, I've been to a lot of adventure film festivals with the kayak movies over the years and uh, seen a lot of environmental films. And really nothing has sort of affected me like this film that I saw called The Game Changers. And um, it was just, it's just all about performance. It, it follows this MMA fighter who dislocated both knees and then he goes and looks for the, the best possible diet to recover from the injury and does a bunch of research. And so it just follows his story. It's from the director that directed The Cove, which is that horrific movie about the dolphin slaughter in on an island off Japan. So it's and it's, the guy won like an Academy Award for that. And so this time around, you know, you'd think that it'd be really environmental based when it's really just the movie is is totally performance based. Huh. And he, the movie basically tries to make the point. And unfortunately, it's it hasn't been released yet. But I would encourage, you know, anybody who's interested in 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 diet and performance to check it out and, you know consider it for themselves but it goes so far as to try to make the point that um any animal protein that you consume comes at a cost of these associated hormones and also you know the the trans fats and the essentially the the cholesterol and and the effect on your blood plasma and that um, it just tries to make the point that originally, you know, the paleo stuff is not correct. That, that anatomically speaking, that we're built to to consume plants. You know, if you think about our teeth in terms of like a, a mortar and pedestal for crushing plant material, as opposed to like um, serrated teeth or you know really sharp teeth for eating meat. Um, so it just tries to it to me it made this very compelling argument that especially as athletes age, um, it is much more advantageous to, to go for uh, a plant-based diet. And, um, and certainly at the end of the movie, it, it drives that point home that something like, you know, this huge amount of our resources, like 75% of our fresh water goes towards supporting the you know big big ag big big meat industry you know you imagine the amount of water the amount of feed the amount of the amazon rain sort forest that's cut down you know to grow the soy crop and and it was just like fuck i just always had in the back of my mind that like it's ne i'm never going to get as enough as much energy i'm never going to I'm never going to get totally what I need. I'm never going to get totally satisfied unless I have meat, unless I have milk, dairy, like I love cheese, all that shit. And, I was just, and then when I saw that movie, I was like, fuck, you know, maybe those assumptions, maybe that assumption is just totally wrong. I thought I'd try it for myself. And I pretty quickly realized that, man, I could get completely satiated on a plant-based diet. I could make food that was super savory. I call it like vegan comfort food. And um, and I also found that like, I didn't really feel like I needed to drop weight, but I went from like 180 to 170, dropped like 10 pounds and just felt, man, when I went for a run, I do, I, I grew up running, ran competitively in high school I've, I've always run to stay in shape especially for these big portage fests that i like to get into uh i, I, I just don't, yeah that's uh the most polite way of describing one of your trips i think <laughs> i just found that like if i'm carrying around 10 less pounds of weight you know somewhere on that 100 mile trek into myanmar my knee had decided to stop working so like i just i, I just there were two things for me i i could feel satiated after I ate, um, I felt really good and I felt like it was potentially going to give me more years to do this, you know, this fucked up shit to my body. Um, and so that's really where my head's been at. And 
I like the idea that, you know, that, that it could be a kinder, gentler way to treat our planet, you know, especially in terms of big meat. I, I grew up in Greeley, Colorado, which at that time had the largest feedlot on earth. Monfort feedlot it's the same family who ended up buying you know bringing the Colorado Rockies uh, it, this huge wealthy family but they had this massive feedlot right next door I remember as kids they'd bring us to the feedlot um, as a school feed field trip and right when we got to the feedlot they'd always feed us or give us a, you know a fresh uh, carton of chocolate milk or a little thing of chocolate ice cream. So still, when I drive past these feedlots, all I think when I smell cow shit is like chocolate milk, <laughs> which is kind of fucked up, right? And, yeah, and, the con- and the conditions of those animals is fucked. Um, but I digress. It was really, it was really about the, the idea of performance. You know, I'd heard that, that Rush had gone that route, so... When I saw the movie, I immediately sent it to him. He was like, fuck, man, you know, I'd been trying to articulate and tell people, you know, this exact same thing. So I think that it certainly really resonated with him. Yeah, sure. I'll, he, I, I, I spoke to Rush about this when I interviewed him, and he was not able to, um, to like, as, as ex- explain it as well as you just have there. Well, but, well the I'm thing is, is I think, like, I'm, I'm going to inevitably fall short. I would really encourage anyone, you know, especially, um, you know, I, I've sent it to folks that I know are just, they're never going to go vegan. They're just not. Their culture is hunting. Um, they're, you know, they're sort of outdoorsmen in that classic sense. And it's just not, that's, it's, it's counter to like what, where their passion is, like part of their spirituality is in fishing and hunting. But, um, but I think that that's really the compelling thing about this movie is that it doesn't make this culturally cultural based argument. It's purely performance based. Interesting. And well, I look forward to checking that one out when I get the opportunity. That's, right on. Uh, it does does sound like yeah, maybe uh, that'll help Brush explain his uh, his food eating habits. You you kind of brought it up already in your answer there, but um, you are getting pretty old now. Like you're over forty. If you could go back and give 20-year-old you one piece of advice, what would you give? 20-year-old me, one piece of advice. Damn. Uh, Sure, it's hard to pick. Okay, no, no, I got it. I got it. I would, you know, I would have definitely told the 20-year-old me to, like, be ready to uh, buy a bunch of stock and Facebook. (laughs) <laughs> um, you know, like, like that sort of back to the future bullshit where you can like give the 20 year old you that, you know, that sports book with all the, the betting odds. You can just like, but then again, you know, like these, the, uh, I don't know, you know, it's like, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty stoked about having had the opportunity to make some mistakes and, and pretty grateful that, um, you know, that when I got behind the wheel when I was 19 and was completely fucked up, I didn't kill anybody, you know, and end up in jail and fucked up for the rest of my life. So I think that, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a crazy balance of being able to take risks. You know, that's, I think that's what bonds a lot of us as, as kayakers and people that love the river, especially the class side class five part of the river is like, being able to take those risks. And I think that the river is such an amazing venue to be able to take those risks because I think in, when you're doing it properly, you're, you're sober, you're of sober mind. You're, you're trying to take every, you know, you're trying to mitigate every risk. You're trying to evaluate the line, evaluate what's happening off the line. Like it's just such a eyes wide open experience as opposed to, uh, you know, the the real dangerous scenarios, or party scenarios, or just driving down the road not paying attention that get you in a spot where you know nobody wants to nobody wants to get in a car accident, nobody wants to um, you know hurt someone when they're inebriated or something like that. So I would just say that you know if if at all possible 
just be hyper cognizant and try to really define the venue where you take your risks, but do, do try to take those risks, but try to take them for the right reasons and, and, and certainly try to try to make sure that the risk that you take is your own. Right on. Okay. When I was talking to Rush, we talked about um, what helped like YGP movies and especially how they impacted my life as like a teenager. <laughs> and that was like from England. That was how I was exposed to like a lot of whitewater kayaking. Um, right at the same time as I was seeing those YGP movies, I remember reading like Hotel Charlie, like trip reports and like Darren mm-hmm. McCoy blogs and stuff with you and Chris from like 2008 and stuff or around mm-hmm. that time. Um, mm-hmm. When you were an up and comer, when you were young, what, who, who expanded your horizons? Who was it that you saw either like maybe not on a video or whatever you guys had back in those days? Um, who, who was it who, or who or what were the things that you saw that kind of broadened your horizons of what else is out there? Yeah. So, um, yeah, certainly let's see my, my first kayaking movies was, were like, um, the Driftwood Productions from from Scott Lindgren. Prior to him going straight to SLP, Scott Lindgren Productions, it was like Driftwood Productions, which was was like the Kern Brothers and Lindgren. Um, you know, certainly there was there was uh, looked up to that. Got got motivation, got inspiration from those guys. Um, the original Twitch. I hate to say it, but yeah, Teo inspired <laughs> me to some extent to go search after these rivers, these crazy places. Um, I definitely remember seeing some National Geographic shows when I was a kid and, and definitely some of my first exposure to kayaking prior to ever getting in the river was just through some random National Geographic specials. And I can't even remember who exactly was on the trip, but I remember it was it was one of these first source to seas of the Yangtze River. You know, obviously, obviously, prior to the Three Gorges Dam going in, but I just remember seeing these these trips, and kayaking was just so far. And this was this was long before my first kayaking movies, but um, and especially growing up in Greeley, Colorado, like the river isn't really like a, a center point of of culture, especially at that time really wasn't. And so it was just such a wild thing to consider is floating down the river that, um, yeah, I think that that was, that was a big, big inspiration, big motivating factor, something that certainly made me curious for, or maybe set me up for later on in life when, you know, when I finally had the opportunity to, uh, to leave my hometown, go to college, and, and ended up finding kayaking for the first time out on a, a summer job out near Moab, Utah. Um, cool. But yeah, okay, actually, so... now that I think about it, my first kayaking movie was uh, was Paddle Quest. So it was like Cornez and oh. Dan Gavir, uh, freaking Spelius, you know, they did the Susitna, they were down the Fuda. It was, you know, this... These guys, yeah, there was back, um, in the, back in the VHS days. Yeah, so just as a point of uh, point of interest, the first big na- first no big names in two thousand one was a VHS release. I uh, when I was eighteen, I used to work in a kayak store, and we had uh, so they'd be, we just had kayaking videos on in the background all day. But we had a lot of the old VHS series, like the still twitching series, and the uh, Oh, a, a bunch going back through the, those like late '90s, early 2000s VHS it was always super interesting to see. Yeah, even like then, like that would have been like 2008 probably, and that was yeah. to see where they're going from like '98 to 2008, where we are now in 2018. It's um, still, in, in my opinion, it's super interesting to see how it's changed and the barrier entries changed. Um, but we're getting a little. I've got bigger, one more question on my li- on my list here. Bigger, I'll just mention uh, bigger, bigger than rodeo with the uh, Ed Lucero first descent of Alexandria. Make oh. sure, make sure that uh, your listeners haven't seen that one. 
Um, okay, last question from me, and then I've got a few audience questions, and then I'm going to call this guy done. Um, cool. Well, in my extended research, I got to the video where you guys are kayaking off glaciers. You're like sailing around the boat and then kayaking off these waterfalls that fall off like little icebergs. Um, yep. And I wondered if there have been any times where you're just like, okay, at some point this is like just straight up for TV. Like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Like, this, this is come a long way from like epic expedition like crossing greenland to go paddle a river that there'd be no other way to access <laughs> i thought that was actually a good idea we we showed up there a little late in the season it was early september in svalbard um that's actually i think it's like the fourth third or fourth largest ice cap in the northern hemisphere off the one of the northern islands of the svalbard archipelago up in northern Nor norway and, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, we knew that it was late, but, um, you know, we had, we had sailed up the coast of, of Svalbard for like seven days to get to that point. And so when we saw that the water, it was too cold and the water was just trickling off the side of the, uh, of the ice cap there, kind of still... Still, still wanted to go up there and check it out. And, yeah, I mean, the boys, uh, Pedro and Chris, just ended up jumping off the, the front of the ice cap into the ocean. And, yeah, I guess I, guess I could say that that was definitely a time when I, uh, I got in the kayak and did a, did a seal launch for the camera, for sure. Yeah, I don't, I, like, I'm, not, I'm not trying to show them what you, what you did there, but it's just No, like, no, no. It wasn't no, but like, it's a good point. There's so much other we stuff you've done that's so sick, and that's just like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's no, uh, it, was, it was fairly anticlimactic. I was definitely glad I didn't take a bigger hit in the ocean, but we ended up going back. I think the following year we went back with a uh, Brazil network show. And it was running, and it was it was fucking sick. We found this eighty footer, but um, oh God, it was just sketchy as fuck. We we actually had a real ship that time because we because the the show had like over a hundred thousand dollar budget. We were on like a, a small trawler that that people would use for like commercial fishing, and um, parked out front of this eighty foot waterfall, and the face. Like this 80 to 120 foot face of the ice cap would calve um, in the middle of the night while we'd be while we were sleeping, getting ready to like make the big trek up and around, and it would calve because we couldn't like we weren't gonna ice climb up the side of the thing. First of all, we're fucking shitty climbers, and and second of all, like I don't even think a professional is gonna do it because the thing was constantly calving, and so. <sighs> It was, but it was, it was real deal. We ended up running a pretty sick little section um, that was maybe just, I mean, this time at least it was like 80 CFS as opposed to like 0.8 CFS. <laughs> um, and went, you know, went over this 30 foot falls. It was kind of cool, but there was a real deal like 80 footer that would have been, sick. that would have made that, that realization of that mission would have, I think it would have communicated some sort of making sense of that that particular trip but yeah you're right that's well uh, i guess yeah, i haven't I sometimes haven't you get that, sometimes you lose you know sometimes you yeah hike sometimes 100 win. miles and get it you just end up uh getting detained by the fucking the myanmar secret police so yeah, you know I, I it doesn't mean, always work out yeah fuck. i mean yeah sometimes she goes sometimes she doesn't that's just the way she goes all right. Um, yeah, but I haven't seen version two of that. I'll look into it some more. It wasn't on the first few Google pages. Um, all right, let's get into some audience questions here. I opened it up on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, maybe in the future on Twitter, but for now, just just those two. Uh, and I've got a few pretty good questions I want to come at you with. Um, Chris Hertz asks, what's your favorite type of pain? <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Like you, you definitely yeah, have the reputation pain. for the the king of pain in in the mm. world. Like, <laughs> what's your favorite kind of pain? Um, I I don't know. I guess I got addicted to that that kind of uh, distance running pain in high school, and then translated that into uh, long distance portaging. But I have to say that uh, my longtime partner Chris Korbulik is probably more um he he's able to deal with that pain better than i am which is kind of fucked up so 
be careful if you go on a portaging trip with that that crazy bastard but yeah, yeah probably that just sort of like thing, you know what's up fucking walk and carry and go until you just like can't go anymore set your boat down and then and keep going like that's that's the sort of pain that uh that uh yeah that i can deal with Okay, next up, we got Amanda Scott, who says, you run some pretty mental uh, stuff, hard to reach in remote rivers. Is there any, or are there any rivers you wouldn't even contemplate going to? That I wouldn't contemplate going to? Yeah, is there no. anything that's just, no. like, not on your radar at all? There's something you wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't even attempt? I mean, there's some rivers that, like, that I have a, a real hard time. Like, I mean, just... I don't know. I, I, I definitely look at this Kwanzaa mission that, uh, that Dawson is currently on and I get, I get pretty, pretty fucking pretty scared about the, the idea of being in a, in a big river with, with Crocs again. Yeah. It sounds like so I guess most, that's it about the first close. time you did that. It wasn't as scary as the, mo the more recent trip they're on. Yeah. Like I remember. Yeah. I mean, and then even like, didn't sound even that bad. Seeing, yeah. Even seeing Benny, go to uh merch man like and then yeah, that video is nuts like holy Fuck, that video you know, is so like, nuts that croc is like right there and I, I was speaking to adrian about it like the day after they got back from that trip and she was like yeah penny got a video but it happened worse another time that we didn't get on video i was like oh my god like that thing yeah. is massive and it just wants to eat you like i don't yeah. yeah i don't feel good about that at all yeah it's fucked up but i think in in with that being said um you know, the things that scare you the most, the, the, the river trips that seem the most unattainable, you know, those are the ones that if you, if you put in the work, you put in the research, um, you know, you can, you can take that step. I mean, this is, this is a small little planet we live on. And so to say that some river is off limits, you know, I, the one, the one scenarios that I think where rivers are like truly off limits, like probably rivers in North Korea, that sort of thing. Like if you're, you know, maybe even if, you, if you're patient enough, those sorts of access issues can change. So I, I, I wouldn't put anything totally out of, out of the realm of possibility, but you know, certainly there are those scenarios that are, yeah, pretty, yeah. pretty hard to, to yeah. I mean, think. you know, I'm going to, that should be your, your headline for this episode. I think it's like uh, Ben Stukesbury. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go to any river. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay, people, next question. People who, people who really know me are going to be like, yeah, he's bullshit. <laughs> All right, three questions to go and then we're done. I got okay. uh, Noah Horan. What would you do if you woke up tomorrow and it was 13 years in the past and you were your younger self but still had your current memories and experiences? <laughs> well, contrary to that. <laughs> yeah, another question about like what apparently, had to play apparently so contrary to popular belief, I, I am I'm just forty. I'm not fifty yet. So come come back to me when I'm when I'm fifty and ask me that same question. Because honestly, I I I feel like I can run anything right now that I ran when I was uh, twenty seven. Um, I guess you know maybe maybe if if I didn't if I hadn't have had those experiences where I almost drowned or got knocked out off a 90 footer, then maybe, you know, maybe that, that those experiences are the things that are actually holding me back from sending it like I used to, um, which is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on, you know, whether you're trying to get rad off of a 30 meter falls, or if you're just <laughs> trying to maintain and keep at it for another decade. So, uh, I guess that's okay, a right, about way of saying, uh, circle, circle ask me, ask me again in 13 years and I'll yeah. let you know. <laughs> okay, Mark Richard has a two-part question. How do you decide who goes first on a new rapid? And what's the dirtiest expedition you've ever been on? Did you have to burn any of the associated gear that was uh, on that trip with you? <laughs> uh, the first one. Um, what was the first question? <laughs> um, it was... Uh, how do you decide who goes first on a new oh, rapid? How do you decide who goes first? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've always I mean, found sometimes, rock, sometimes rock, paper, scissors, like, it's, it's very rare. It's it. very rare where no one like actually steps up. Like these are that's why we go out there is to have that opportunity to like go big in these 
incredible venues like that you've struggled and worked and ported your ass off and get to the point where you feel good enough that like usually someone on the trip or, you know especially if you're boating with, with people like eric boomer or nuria or freaking benny for god's sakes or you know chris or like everybody has their moment it seems when they're like yeah i'll step up and it's the fucked up moments are the ones where you're, you know, you're literally locked into a box Canyon. Like when Chris and I were locked into this box Canyon in, in India, in Arunachal Pradesh, India on the Debong river. And we hiked around for like two days trying to figure out if we could fucking get out, hike out. If there's any other way than going downstream, like that's the one situation where you're like, shit, if you run this first one first, then I'll run the next one, you know? Um, but yeah, if you're boating with like Lane Jacobs, uh, it's you have these amazing, amazing boaters, these amazing opportunities, and usually someone in the group is actually fired up to take the sharp end and, and go for it. Uh, in terms of the dirtiest expedition that I've ever been a part of, I mean, definitely my my dirtiest feeling river that I've ever been on was the Chiate that runs through São Paulo, Brazil. Is just like fucking like meter high stacks of trash in the eddy. The, the river smells like a, a sewer for sure. But there's also these massive capivari floating around, you know, like the largest rats on earth that are like oh, surfacing. Wow. It's like a cross between a rat and a little hippopotamus. That's that was definitely it. the dirtiest, but it, I wouldn't call I wouldn't call that an expedition at all. So I'd have to say that like that, uh, fuck that river in PNG was like one of the cleanest most pristine places but our feet got so fucked up that i definitely burnt some burnt some socks burnt some under layers after that trip just because yeah, i think uh, i think know. benny but burnt all his underwear from that trip <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad we were on the same page there yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's weird yeah i that's uh, that's the one thing that i think is interesting is that like just how much easier it can be to deal with the cold than it can be to deal with like the intense jungle situations and just keep like keep your shit from getting rotten really yeah um okay if you okay actually this is a short one have you ever drunk your own urine like outdoorsman bear grills <laughs> no but we had to after uh 13 what was it? at that point i guess it would have been 11 it was a 13 hour fucking worst 13 hours of consecutive foraging in my life on the Piaxla River in uh, Durango, Mexico. And about, after about a la- hour 11 without water, we, we came across this pond that, you know, probably hadn't seen a rainstorm in like 12 days, this manky, oh, piss-colored pond that um, I, I literally thought I was going to fucking pass out and I could not even... I, all we had was iodine and I could not wait, definitely could not wait the whatever recommended 15 minutes, about 30 seconds in. I was just guzzling this <laughs> piss, piss colored, like an amoeba filled pothole sh- water. Um, but yeah, no piss. Um, okay, well, let's go ahead. And then last one from Ryan. Spank. Unless someone, someone probably pissed in my beer at. Um, <laughs> and on the Nile at some point. It was a pretty wild Yeah, I was going to say that sounds N- NRA. Yeah, I didn't get pretty wild. <laughs> um, if you had to dam three NRA, rivers yeah, in the world. That's what I was. <laughs> yeah, I hear you, bro. If, uh, if you had to dam three rivers in the world <laughs> or all the rivers in the world will be dammed, which three would you dam? <laughs> this is a tough one. Do I, have to, do I have to dam rivers that haven't been dammed yet? Um... It's not no. clear in the question, so I, t- take it take it as you will, man. I don't know. It's an audience question. Like I'm just, you know, it's from Ryan to you, like mm. Ryan me. You know, interpret it however you want. Oh, th- oh yeah. First of all, um, yeah, I guess I'd I damn the Chiate because it seems like it's already fucked and totally polluted. So why not just damn it? You know, Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is. Uh, 2,000 feet right above the ocean. So I think if we put a big dam on it, then we can uh, create some good hydroelectricity. Uh, I will dam. What other river can I dam? 
God, I hate fucking dibs. <laughs> Let's. I mean, God damn, we've already fucked up the Columbia. You know, why not? Why not dam the you know the Columbia River somewhere near Portland, and um, you know, fuck, I don't know. I'm I'm at a loss here. It was a it was a tough. Okay, I'm gonna dam. All right, I'm damming the Columbia. I can I'm damming the Chiate, and I'm going to dam. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm gonna get hate mail after this. I'm gonna get death threats. I doubt it. Let's I think say. like, Ernie, like <laughs> I'm pretty sure only my mom and like five other people listen to this podcast. So I, perfect. I, I highly, I highly doubt any death mail is coming. <laughs> Um, gosh, I, I should probably have a much better answer of a, of a river that has just this perfect section of white water. Uh, I would definitely put a dam at the top of Big Kimshu Creek in Northern California, and, which would be really helpful for them right now so they could put out this fucked up fire in paradise, but also so that uh, we could have uh, weekly releases on Big Kimshu Creek, which is my favorite creek in the world so there you go big kimchi right. creek the columbia river still which i'm not sure I, I was thinking about saying that i'd like to wash away some of the some of the metro hipsters down there but that's kind of mean but i'll stick with that and then uh chiate because um maybe we can make some power and stop damming some of the, the amazonian rivers for for power all right, perfect. Well, that's the end of my kind of audience questions round. Um, ben, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. This has been questions you never thought to ask. If you want to support this podcast, please hit us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Seth Ashworth. And I will see you in a future podcast.